<laughs> All right. So my name is Connor Diblin. I'm a going into my fourth year um, of medical school at King College London. Uh, I'm on the extended medical degree program, which is the widening access um, medical degree program at King's. Um, so I'm going into my fourth year of medicine. Uh, I've just finished my intercalated IBSC also at King's. I did that in imaging sciences. Um, so I applied for medicine seven years ago now. So I applied in 2013 and deferred. I applied for deferred entry. Gap year. And then I've done six, I'm going into my sixth year of university. So when I want to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, I'm Momna. Um, I'm also in my fourth year of medicine, but it's my fifth year because I intercalated at UCL last year and I did cardiovascular sciences. I applied to medicine in 2016, straight from school. Um, hi, I'm Bridget. So I'm going into my fifth year at the university. Yeah is my fourth year in medicine because I integrated in third year in pharmacology and yeah I applied in 2016. Um, and I'm going into my second year at Bots and the London School of Medicine and I applied just two years ago so I've just finished my first year so basically just applied last year or the year before. Great so you're going to have the most up-to-date information in terms of <laughs> having done it most recently. <laughs> All right, we already have a question, which is amazing. So guys, uh, those of you who are watching, put your questions in the chat. Um, we're gonna go through, I think most of the questions we can probably all chime in on. Um, if you have specific questions about any of our specific universities, that's also great. Um, so I guess we'll just start with how hard were the interviews? So um, I can talk about King's interviews all day. So uh, at King's, they like the MMI interview. So the multiple mini interview um method and they still use that now um multiple mini interview method uh you generally have between five um and sometimes up to ten normally around eight um multiple mini interviews um and you kind of go around like a circuit each one lasts about less than 10 minutes um and i really liked it because it means that you get to kind of reset between each one so each one has a very specific kind of remit um, each one is a specific task or a specific question and you only have to think about that and then you forget about it and you move on. Um, I really preferred that to my other, I had some panel interviews um, where you had to kind of try and keep a train of thought running throughout the whole interview. Um, and I, I feel I definitely did better on the MMI. Um, I don't know about what, what you guys think. Um, um Oh, no, go for it. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. You go, you go. I was just going to say, so when I applied to Edinburgh, they weren't doing interviews. So Edinburgh literally just started doing an interview for the mm. intake of 2020 this year. So obviously, which is all based on like mm. your personal statement, your grades and all of that. But I helped out for the um, interview that they were doing. They call it Selection Day. And it's kind of like a mix between MMI and panels. So you get some of my station, you get some panels. Whereas my other interview, so I did Nottingham, which is MMI as well. And I did Cardiff, which was panel. So yeah. I guess it's just all different. It's kind of like what Connor said, at least with an MMI, you can sort of go into each station with a different mind. Whereas my Cardiff one, I think was 25 minutes just straight. And it was just sometimes you were like, mm -hmm. I just need a break. And it's just kind of like, I guess it's knowing what the uni course is about, knowing what the uni is about. And that sort of makes it easier for you to get through your interview because they do sort of ask you, you know, why this uni, why this course, that sort of thing. So it is, I think it changes each year. So I can't say, you know, it's hard in this uni, it's easy in this uni. It's just all depends on you and sort of what's happening that year. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I had a mix of panel and MMIs. And because I expected um, most of my interviews to just be panel, and then it was my first time, like, finding out what an MMI was, I think I was quite nervous, but... Like, it's quite good because if you feel like one station was hard, you can go into the next one with, like, a fresh mind. So you have, like, multiple opportunities to prove yourself. But with a panel, it's like um, people, if they get nervous, they feel like it's just over. So I think there's good, like, with both of them. Though. Yeah, I think it's important to try and kind of play to your strengths. So other some people might feel like they're going to, that maybe you're really charismatic, maybe you really like making a connection with one person or a couple of people, in which case try and go for a panel. Um, if you're someone who might get a little bit nervous or 
Uh, if you feel like you're particularly strong in certain areas, maybe an MMI is slightly better because you get to kind of show that off one at a time. Um, yeah, go on, Jane. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, I'm going to pin the next question so we can see, like, right there for you to see because quite a few came in all at once then. So. Oh, fantastic. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you, James. All right, this, this is the, I feel like this is a bit of a controversial one, um, but maybe that's just the Kings. Do you prefer digital or paper notes? Um, what do you guys think? I'm all school. Um, oh. Yeah, same. <laughs> so paper all the way. But digital is like easier to add on to, whereas paper is like once you made them, you made them. So it depends on how you think as a person. Like I like to write it down because that's my way of learning. So I listen, write it down, and then like, look at it again but like some people just this tool is like easy to carry on so i just yeah. don't have my notes from first to second year but people who made digital notes they still have that so it plays yeah yeah i think it's just also how much time you have because i feel like sometimes writing it all out can take a lot longer than you know you just typing up but mm -hmm. pre-clinical so from first to third year i actually wrote notes because like people said i actually learned better sort of writing it down because i felt like i had to learn it was when i got to fourth year again like what moment and said it's because like each week was sort of like adding on to the topic so it was weird if I made note one week and then having to add it on just made it all messy so I just sort of like made digital notes and then when it came to revision sort of did like paper summarizing notes because again that's how I learned so it just depends on your sort of learning style but yeah yeah I think I'm, I'm one of the kind of hybrid -y. I bought I, I in my second year of uni Kings uh, or Kings used to at the start of every term give you give every single medical student a printout of every single lecture slide. So you were given like a booklet that was like this big of every single lecture you were going to have that term. And then they stopped doing that, which is great, obviously save the environment. <laughs> but then they gave us all of our lectures as PDFs, which I was finding really hard to use on my laptop. So I ended up buying an iPad Pro. Um, so with the if you have an iPad Pro, you can take like handwritten notes but digitally. So um, I think they're very expensive, but if you can afford one, I, I think they are great as a medical student. Um, is it appropriate to mention one of your reasons for applying is to bridge the gap for BAME if your concerns aren't taken seriously and to help them see someone like themselves? That is a very insightful question. Um, yeah. So is it appropriate to mention one of your reasons for applying to medicine is to bridge the gap uh, for BAME individuals? I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, because um, you can like that's one of your aspirations. So you want to become a role model in the future. So that like you'd come across as like someone with loads of goals and they'd like that about you, that you're actually thinking about the future after medical school. Yeah. And it's also like you've identified problems that you think is there and you sort of try to come up with a solution as to I want to advocate for these specific disadvantaged people. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is a conversation that needs to be had in every industry um, and medicine is no exception. This is a really important conversation that's happening right now. Um, and so, yeah, I think being aware that, that is an issue and, and talking about a way to solve that is fantastic. Um, I think if that's genuinely a passion of yours, and you can speak passionately about it or write passionately about it, definitely, definitely mention that. Um, so do you guys mind if I just keep asking the questions or yeah, if yeah, we finish talking about it? Sense, just have one All, right. Person, yeah. All right, so this is that classic interview question. Why did you pick medicine and not nursing or dentistry? Did everyone have a prepared answer for this before their interviews? <laughs> <laughs> that was like five years ago. Literally. So Naya, you just done your you're, you're you're the most recent. Did you ever Yeah, I remember I got this question at every interview, which is weird because I didn't expect it to be at every interview. So I think the main thing with nothing is that it's it's like um the best thing to do is to acknowledge that like nursing is still an important field because um, a lot of medical <laughs> students, when they go to the interviews, they're like, doctors have more authority and all that. And it makes them seem like they're looking down on nursing as a career, which is like, it's wrong. So I think that's the first thing to do when you answer the question. And then the next thing is 
when you're a doctor, you can, like, you can teach, you can also specialize more, like, you're, you can do that as a nurse, but you can just do more as a doctor, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the, the most important part of answering that question, if you get asked it, is to not belittle any other healthcare profession. In a, in a healthcare environment, in a caring environment, every single member of the team is as important as the other ones. Um, so I think it's a big part of answering a question like this is to not say that doctors are more important or or have have more um, you know importance in, in any kind of clinical role. Um, I think the answer that I had prepared was kind of along the lines of um, I wanted to do research more, um, which there are more just more opportunities to do as a doctor. Um, and I think I think answering saying why not dentistry is fairly easy if you're just not into teeth. Um, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't into teeth or mouths really so that's that's why I didn't apply for dentistry yeah I think dentistry is probably the same thing I don't think I actually even considered it I think for nursing for me like my mum's a nurse so I've actually like shadowed nurses I've got placement of shadowed doctors and I think I was just more like I felt like medicine was more my place and it's just like both of them have said it's obviously not degrading nurses or you know the job that they do because they are really important to like healthcare and like the hospitals and even GPs but it's just saying you know why you personally just felt like you know medicine was right for you over anything else yeah that, I think that's a really good part yeah. of the answer to say that you've considered it and then you've decided like made a conscious decision I definitely agree oh sorry uh, with this next one there's um two that are kind of the same so there's and keeping up to date and then obviously social life so I thought bring those two in together yeah um, so did someone else want to take a lead who's got a good social life at medicine in, in medical <laughs> um, <laughs> well I think balancing social life and like medicine is hard as a fresher, I think, because you're trying to find the balance of like, how much should I go out? And obviously like this freshest week, you have to go out every single day. And then after keep coming on social. So like initially I found it really hard to not neglect work because you literally moved out of home like just now and you don't know how to cook. Like I didn't know, I still don't know how to cook, but passed all the way. But um, so you don't know how to cook. You have to do your own laundry. You have to live by yourself. And I kind of like, I feel like the freedom sometimes makes you neglect work a bit that's what i found so it takes time to obviously find your balance so you have to be like you have to study but you have to like make sure you still have friends i feel like with medicine it's i found it easier to have a social life compared to like other degrees i don't know if you felt the same because i found it easier to make friends if that makes sense because you go to lectures with them you live with them you see them like all the time whereas other courses is a lot more independent yeah, I know I'd agree. I think to a certain extent, you're kind of forced together with people. And yeah, you can't help but be social with them. Yeah, because I'd remember even just because I lived with non medics, my flatmates in the first year, and you know, would go out and I'd see all the medics, you know, go say hi to them, be like, Why do you know so many people on your course? Like, I don't know anyone <laughs> on my course. And I'm like, You know, I'm with them for like the next six years, I'm with them for everything. Whereas I feel like with other courses, you, know, you have different electives, you choose different, you do different mm -hmm. sorts of tutorials with different people. Whereas with medics, you sort of get all the time. But again, I guess it's also finding friends that aren't medics because it can get a bit too much just your life centering mm -hmm. around medicine. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, there's loads of, you know, societies, loads of clubs out there in unis joining like sports if you're interested in any sports. So I think mm -hmm. it's really important not to lose your hobbies. So if you have any hobbies now, there's probably a society for it at uni. If there isn't, you can make one. So it's just trying not to, you know, forget about all the things that you've done before and just think, I have to focus solely on medicine to get a good grade. You can balance it out. Yeah, I agree. Like, you can, if you find the right balance, you can have a social life and also do well at uni. So it's just what works for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know about you. I don't know about you each of your medical schools, but at King's, a, a huge part of social life for most people or for lots of people um, kind of revolves around sports. Um, at King's, a lot of medics are into sports, even if they don't do it, even if they don't play competitively, they're just in it for the kind of camaraderie and like the, like make, you know, having people who have to be your friend to a certain extent. Um, so I think for me, especially my first year, that's kind of how I, how I found friends outside of my course as well was through sports. Um, this is probably one for for some of the older people, uh, well not older people, but 
more senior <laughs> medical students. Sure my age. Um, <laughs> what are the clinical placements like at your respective universities? Um, at Brighton, I feel like they've changed a lot since I started. So when we started, they were really good. So every in first year, every Tuesday, and in second year, every Thursday, we had clinical placements. Um, we had GP like once a week, which is so good when you want to practice OSCEs and stuff. And then we had like uh, secondary care, and then we had like community stuff. So it would rotate. But I think now they've changed it. So it's more specialized placements. So you have like plastics and stuff like that, which I didn't have when I was in. But it is quite good. Like it's a teaching hospital, and everyone's really like, come, I'll teach you like everything you need to know. So I think in Brighton, it is quite good. And then because we're a trust, so it covers all of the Southeast. So sometimes you might have to travel, but the med school is really good. So they pay for your taxis. So if I have to go to Croydon, it's like a 40 minute taxi and they'll pay for us to go there or Eastbourne or something like that. So it's quite good. Um, and then as you go up, so in fourth and fifth year, which is what I'm going into, um, you might have placements in Kent as well because our med school is growing because we're taking more and more med school students every year. Um, and yeah, they'll pay for you to either live there so get your hospital accommodation or pay for your taxi from Brighton, which I like the idea because I think a lot of other med schools don't reimburse you for traveling, but Brighton does. Um, yeah. With Edinburgh, we're quite, so we've got preclinical and clinical, so we're a six year program. The first two years is preclinical, the third year you have to intercalate um, and then the other three years is clinical. So the first two years, you sort of do, you do a bit of clinical, but it's not really that clinical in first year. Um, you go, you're paired up with someone else and you go visit a patient in their home and you sort of interview them about, you know, their idea of their illness and what they think it is. So you sort of learn about like the social aspect of medicine. And then in second year, we've got this thing called ICP, so Introduction to Clinical Practice, where a group of seven of you sort of go to a GP, but we don't actually get to see patients. We sort of do OSCE stuff on ourselves. So it's very like, patient contact is very limited in like the first three years. And then once intercalation is over and you get into the clinical stage, then you sort of start to do a lot more placements. You're in the hospitals quite a lot because we have one week of like lectures and then the rest of the year, it's just placements. You sort of rotate. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of the same, especially in fifth and sixth year where you sort of go around. So we get to go to like, the borders, get to go to five, Dundee. So we, we get accommodation as well. We do get travel as well. So that's a good thing as well. So it's like we get like a burst. We get like £250 for the year for just being in Edinburgh and if you end up having a placement outside of 20 miles of the centre I think they give you accommodation or they pay you for your transport so it is really good they do consider the fact that obviously some people can't afford to travel outside and all of that kind of stuff so yeah then that, I think that's something that you sort of need to look at as well when you apply to uni sort of what the placements are like if you like the divide if you like integrated if you want patient contact from day one if you don't yeah yeah so King's is King's is integrated so um at King's effectively in your first second and third year you do like one two and three days a week in uh, clinical placements so um particularly in second and third year you're in a hospital um either one or two days a week and you're in a, either a gp or a mental health placement for either one or two days a week um so at king's you start your patient contact really early on um just like with um bridget and mama um our fourth and fifth year placements are much more intensive so it's five days a week um you know you might end up having to do some nights or weekends and things as well um and a lot of king's students have to be outside of london um king's is a huge university we have like 450 people in each year um, of medicine and so you'll spend at least several blocks outside of london in your placements. so we do in fourth and fifth year you do eight week um clinical blocks so I'm I'm just starting fourth year in, in August. Um, my first block is at Guy's and St. Thomas's in central London. My second block is um, in Ashford in Kent. So if you're placed outside of the M25, which is like outside of Greater London, the ring road around London, um, they give you accommodation. But otherwise, um, I think you get reimbursed for travel, something like if you pay more than eleven pounds a day for travel, they'll reimburse you over eleven pounds, um, but you're expected to pay that first amount. So generally, for fourth and fifth year, people have to be very strategic in where they live, because um, you try and you try and live kind of in the middle of all of the hospitals that you might be in for, for two years. But if you're outside of London, you get given accommodation. So, so now, have, have you started clinical placements yet at Bart's? Um, 
So in first year, just every fortnight, like every other Thursday, you're in a GP placement. Yeah. So over there you can see patients, but then it kind of depends on your GP tutor if they give you these opportunities, basically. So I was lucky because we got to like interview patients and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. We have a very specific question for you. Uh, so out of the UCAT personal statement and your A-level grades, which is the most important um, for BARPS? This might not be something that you know. Um, well, when I applied, um, there was like a system where they would compare the UCAT or UK cut with your A-level grades. So like one can comp compensate for the other kind of. Mm -hmm. So if your predicted grades were A star, A star, A, but then your UCAT was slightly lower than it should have been, then you could still get the interview. So it's quite varied. Okay, that seems that seems pretty fair. Uh, I would say that you can just look that stuff up online. Um, most of the universities will specifically say how they use the different parts of the application process um, just on their course websites. If you look at their prospectus, uh, it will say, you know, how they use things, whether they have a cutoff, um, what, what the minimum grade requirements are, whether they offer um, contextualized offers, which is where they have a look at the context of which school you go to um, and maybe give you a slightly lower offer based on that. Um, okay, we have another very kind of insightful question, um, which is, would you recommend someone with a social anxiety pursue medicine? Anyone got any particular thoughts on that? Yes, um, I think people don't realize like social anxiety is a lot more common than we think. And it's something that should definitely not stopping you from applying to medicine. Like they're it's something that you can control as well. So like you can you can take meds, you can do therapy, like don't let it stop you from pursuing your dreams because they're two different things. And med schools have a lot of different things in place as well to support you with any any problem that you have as well. I know especially at Brighton. Um so yeah, and it's something that can develop as well, like as you go along. So yeah. Yeah. What, what do you guys think? I 100% I agree. I think mental health issues should no longer be a barrier to pursuing a career in as being a doctor, doctors are humans, um, you know, anxiety disorders, depression are incredibly common in the, in the general public. And so they're actually more common in medical students and doctors. So, um, you know, medical school is very competitive. It's very high stress. You might see your friends who maybe you went to college with kind of getting on with their life a bit earlier than you do. Um, and all of that, you know, it, it can, be a little bit depressing it can be kind of anxiety provoking at medical school um and yeah I, I don't think that should be a barrier um i definitely think it's something that you should you can talk to your university about or your college about um and something that you can try and work on while you're at medical school we agree yeah yeah how did you guys decide which universities you wanted to apply to? Or which, which universities did you apply to? Let's, let's start with that. So I think I applied to Brighton, Leeds, um, Exeter and Cambridge, I think. And I based it depending on how far it was from my house, which is not good, but, um, and then obviously like, grade requirements and then if they looked at UK CAT or BMAT because I think I wanted to split because um, when we back when we used to do it you couldn't do it in September because I now know you can do it in September you can get your results before you actually submit your application but when I applied you, could, you didn't know your BMAT score till like November or something so it was like kind of like a shot in the dark like you wouldn't know what you had and if you get a bad BMAT score like it's gone um, and then yeah and I looked at if they had like panel or MMI because I prefer panel but I think Leeds had MMI. So yeah, that's why I based it on, like just everything in general. I gave them more scores. Yeah, you've got to find some way. There are, there are 35 great medical schools in the UK and you're only allowed to apply to four of them. So, um, so I applied to mainly UK companies, but then one BMAT one, which was UCL. So I then bought, and so I ended MMI interviews on one panel. So in the end, I preferred 
although I was nervous at first. Um, but the I'm staying. Well, I think she had some technical issues. I think you might have dropped out there. She she's completely dropped out. I'll work on that. If, All right, thanks, James. Um, I'll put up in another the, question for you guys to. Well, in, in the meantime, we could quickly say, Bridget, what? Where did you? Where did oh, you? Oh, so doing? I did Cardiff, Edinburgh, Nottingham, and Imperial. So I think more. I think that is a, it's kind of like a rough trade-off of medicine where you sort of have to apply to your strengths, apply where you think you're going to get in but also consider like the location, the course. So it's quite hard because the places that you think you're going to get in might not necessarily be the places that you know you want to. But it sounds like you applied to everywhere, but you've applied to Wales. <laughs> yeah, I kind of went to <laughs> get one sort of every single I did. Wales, I did Scotland, get everywhere. But um, I think I was more just like, it was weird because I think I kind of wanted to get out of London because I was more in that sort of mindset that if I don't leave London, I was never going to leave London. But I yeah. also really, really liked Imperial. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to apply, see what happens and see if I change my mind. So I think it's just looking at what the course had to offer, looking at the location, because you do have to spend five or six years in that place. So it's obviously make sure that, I don't know, if you're really close, if you're really close to your family, you're someone that needs to be home, it's good distance mm -hmm. to home. If it's, you know, you have responsibilities at home, that kind of thing. So I think sort of judging it from there, but also looking at the uni, there's loads of information available on their website, sort of how they... Um, assess how they select people for interviews how the course runs and just sort of get like a good range between what they want and what you want yeah 100 percent. and it, at the end of the day you you graduate from one of the 35 medical schools in the uk with the same degree yeah. um and obviously it's five or six years of your life so it is important where you go but after you graduate it, it's not going to matter that much um and so don't be too bogged down in like the prestige of which medical school you're applying for or how old the university is, you know, at the end of the day, King's is, you know, the fourth oldest medical school was the fourth oldest university in uh, the UK. It doesn't make it necessarily better than, Ang you know, Angela Ruskin, who just started their medical course. Um, it's, you know, it, everyone has to only, is only able to choose four to apply to. Yeah. I think that's the thing with medicine as a course as well. I feel like most times, maybe with some unis, you know, it's like, oh, I did law at Cambridge. It might be, it sounded a bit more prestige and I did law, I don't know, at one of the other unis. Whereas with medicine, no, most people don't care what uni you went. It's like, you did medicine, you did medicine, you graduated as a doctor. So it doesn't really matter about, you know, you went to one of the Russell Group unis or you went to one of like the lower group unis. It's all kind of the same thing. So I wouldn't use prestige as a way to judge, but rather like the course and, you know, the location, what you want sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Good to have you back, Sanea. Well, yeah, sorry. I I don't know what happened. It got stuck. That's all right. That's all, right. Uh, all right. What advice would you give yourself if you applied now? Let's have one piece of advice each. Hmm. Anyone? Hi, to be my university. No, I was joking. Um, <laughs> basically, <laughs> um, I would tell myself to, okay, so this is something that I didn't consider when I was applying medicine, like, because I wasn't sure about what speciality I wanted to go into. So I didn't really care where I went. But if you know where you want to go to, like, see where, like, if you want to do something like really niche or specialized, like cardiothoracic, like certain universities have placements there. So I, because now I know I want to do that. I would have applied to one that, that was kind of close to one where I could, would be easier to like get placements and stuff. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, I, I think I would, I would say to do, to not worry about like which admissions test a university cares about until after you've done the UCAT. So like, or I guess more generally, just focus on each stage of the application process at once. So right now, only care about the UCAT if you're setting the UCAT. And then after you set the UCAT, start worrying about your personal statement and which universities you're applying to and then worry about the BMAT. Kind of try and try and just give yourself one thing to worry about at a time because it's all very stressful, um, particularly this year. And so just, just try and focus on one thing at a time if you can. Um, I think, I think mine... I... oh, sorry. No, no. I think... Okay, um, I think the main advice would be 
speak to as many medical students as you can who are at different unis so um like there's social media but not a lot of people would actually reach out to medical students like there are a lot of people with blogs and stuff you can just ask them questions and like most people will be happy to help so i think that's a big thing also um, going on to what oh. If you're gonna no, no, go, no, no. I was just going to add like um, a good way to connect with like doctors and medical students is like LinkedIn. So literally just go and drop them a message and most of them would reply. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, I guess with mine is probably not to compare yourself with other applicants. Like the student room is a great place, but sometimes it can just get a bit, you can just end up stressing yourself way too much because you end up applying to the same places that people, you went to the interview the same that you haven't heard back. And everyone's like, oh my God, I got my offer, I got my offer. You can get a bit like, you know, panicky, like, oh my God, I haven't heard anything. But it's what they say, you know, no news is good news. Like if you, if you haven't heard anything yet, then obviously it means you haven't been rejected yet. So I think just go at your own pace and just do your own thing. Like people are going to get offers before you, people are going to get offers after you. That doesn't have any impact whatsoever on you. So just, yeah, do your own thing. Yeah, definitely. I, I would add, particularly for things like the student room and these forums, they're really good for connecting to people, maybe even making friends before you get to university. But there's no, there's no filter. There's no peer review process. There's nothing to make sure that people are telling the truth on there. So when people brag about getting a 900 on the UCAT, like take it with a pinch of salt. Like that's maybe one person a year gets a 900. Um, so all the people claiming to have done that on the student room, um, it, you know, in reality, that's not the case. Um, what made you decide to choose medicine? Was it something you'd always wanted to do? This is another classic interview question. Another good thing to think about before your personal statement. Um, I didn't, I didn't always want to study medicine. I only decided while I was doing my AS levels, um, people had suggested I should be thinking about it. Um, people had been suggesting I should think about it while I was doing my GCSEs. Um, and so I kind of caved and found some work experience and did the work experience. And then I thought, actually, this really could be something that I'd love to do. Um, and would I rather get a medical degree and, and then work out it's not for me? Or would I rather do something else and then wish I'd done medicine? Um, so while, when I was applying, that was kind of my mindset. And now that I'm doing medicine, I can't imagine doing anything else. I think I'm kind of different, like that cliche, I always wanted to do it from a young age. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I think it's just, I think with my mom doing nursing, that kind of was a bit of like, I kind of got drawn into that like hospital environment. And then, yeah, just like, but I think it wasn't, it was more like, okay, this is something I'm interested in, but I guess it's probably once you get to like, you know, your GCS, your six, like when you're 16, that's when you start to think about careers, you know, you go to your careers advice and say, what do you want to do? And you sort of think, okay, you know, I'm good at science, I'm good at this, I like this. So I think my mom was just sort of like, it was something that was a thought in my mind, but it sort of grew as like the years went on rather than like, I don't think I was like 10 and thinking, yes, medicine is it, the be all. I was more like, okay, I want to do it, but like, I don't know what it's like, I'll see how it goes sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree with Bridget. Like, you might say that you've always had an interest, but it's not until you actually speak to people in the field and get some experience, that's when you actually know if you want to do it or not. Um, for Well, I didn't always want to do medicine, like I wanted to do law. Um, and then I started volunteering at a hospice because one of my cousins got sick. And then that's where I realized like, it was just one of those things where you just work it and you're just like, oh, I actually really want to help people, but yeah. Yeah, so I guess we've got quite a big spread here, kind of the, the th three different kind of main, main most common answers to that question. There seems to be, people tend to fall into one of two things in that question. People are either like, I like science and I like caring for people, so medicine, or people are like, I had a moment in my life where mm. I decided. Uh, and uh, no, no one way is no one way is, is right or wrong. Um, it's just as long as it's correct. Don't Don't lie about it. Don't try and make something up. Just be truthful and you know people people will see through it if you're lying and if you have a genuine reason then t tell it um all right when did you start writing your personal statement um my uni was my uni my sixth form was quite strict and like all the oxbridge and medicine like vets and all of that so they had us preparing probably from like probably feb march of year 12 
so they're very much like you know just sort of but it wasn't in like a riot outfit it was more like just write what you think you want to put on there and then like see over the summer what other experiences you can get just add to it i think it was more just of like keep it in your mind and we'd send like a um form to sort of draft and it wasn't like a complete thing it was more like a work and document just keep adding to it and sort of had you know this is what you and i think it was kind of good because it made us sort of see what we're missing so we had like you know headings like you know work experience um i don't know uk cat bma that sort of thing so it's like okay this is what i need to complete but it all depends on obviously your score and you as well but i think definitely like summertime start thinking about it yeah i think i started mine over the summer because you know when you we used to have to do as's i think they don't have to do them anymore i don't know uh but after as i think i started working on my personal statement i had about like 20, 30 drafts because or also, you know, when you write your personal statement and you send it to people, don't send it to everyone at the same time. Do one person at a time because I think I send it to like five, six people together and they all come back and they all have different suggestions and you're like, oh, it's just kind of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of get confused. So do one person at a time. Summer is a good time because what else are you going to do? Like, Corona's here, you can't really go outside or a holiday. So we might as well, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I started mine like probably towards the end of the summer holidays because I had already gotten some experience by then. So I had stuff to actually write about. But I think before you actually start writing the whole like paragraph after paragraph, you need to have like a list of things that you can kind of brag about. So like your experience and stuff. So like a brag list kind of. So you actually have a plan of what you're going to write. Don't just go into it without a plan. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah. I think don't beat yourself up if come September you haven't got a final draft. Like that really that really is okay. Most people will be in the same position. Start planning it now. You know, have a look online. There are there are some great guides. Um I think becoming a doctor has a, a guide on on writing your personal statement. Um just have a look at what those six common sections are, which is introduction, uh, work experience, volunteering, hobbies, interests, conclusion. Start thinking about what's going to go in each of those. And if you look at one and you go, actually, that paragraph is currently empty. Now is the point at which you need to work that out, because now you have time to go and do the the Brighton and Sussex online virtual work experience mm -hmm. or the Royal College of GPs observe GP virtual work experience or get some volunteering or, you know, pick up a hobby. Yeah. So now, that was exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was exactly what I was talking about. Sort of having that list of, you know, this is what I need to do. And then if you, but again, kind of what mom, uh, mom has said is well, sending personal statement. Like, I think it's good to get, you know, as much help as you're like, as people to read it. But I think sometimes they get to a stage where you're getting way too many people to read it. Cause like she said, different people have different opinions and I really wouldn't go over like four or five people like reading even that might be like a little bit of a push. Cause I feel like, different people want different things and no one actually knows you know what even different unis have different things like Oxbridge wants a more academic personal statement Nottingham wants like an extracurricular personal statement so it's going to be hard to fit even all four of your unis into one personal statement let alone different people's opinions so it's like as much as you are getting people's opinions and it's important to get people's opinions try not to get too bogged down with getting you know every single doctor you know get them to review it get your parents to review it get your sisters to review it like it does get a bit too much but it just and it starts to lose like the personal touch of you as well because it starts to be other people's words but yeah mm. I, I would say once you have a final draft you can get as many people as you want to proofread it because nothing looks more unprofessional than having like a grammar mistake or a spelling mistake or you know a capital letter where there shouldn't be one or something so so yeah i i agree you can have you know too many cooks spoil the pot in terms of losing your personality but i think you can't have too many people check it for spelling yeah mm -hmm. also there's like online tools to spell check as well if you, if you want to do that as well oh amazing we've been joined by uh dr jane valentine who's actually the head of my course, um, Hello. EMDP, the Extended Medical Degree Programme at King's. Um, yeah, so Jane can answer some, some of those more academic uh, okay. faculty I'm, I'm just having a quick look through the chat in case um, I've missed anything, because I had to wait to be let in for a while. Um, so carry on talking and then aim any questions at me if we've got any. Uh, so did you enjoy doing an intercalated year? Um, I guess that that's for myself, Bridget and, and Momna. Um, I really did. I've just finished mine. Um, I thought it was fantastic. 
I've really missed medicine, so I'm really keen to get back into medicine in a few weeks. Um, a little bit worried about having forgotten everything I've learned in a year, but um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great chance to learn about something else, learn about something very specific. I did imaging sciences. So um, imaging science at King's is obviously mostly about imaging, but it's also quite a lot about med tech uh, and research. So I, I, that's a, um, what I think is going to be a big passion of mine. So um, that's been really good for me. Uh, it's also given me a chance to get published um, and to kind of pursue my own research. Um, I did pharmacology. I really enjoyed it. So it was, it was nice to have a break from medicine because I felt like, you know, my course is six or would have been five years, but like straight of that. And it kind of gives you the chance to do other things. Like I had a lot more free time doing pharmacology than I did doing medicine. So I could actually like work. So I got a job as a healthcare assistant, gain more experience. I could sort of do more sports in me that wasn't medics sports. So I could sort of meet more people. And it gave me a lot of insight into like Connor said, sort of like research working in the lab like I hadn't done a lab experiment since like year 12 chemistry so it yeah. was like all these little things like and it was weird having like pipettes and like proper ones and be like how do I use this and so it was very nice like learn like the research but it really weird because I wouldn't think research would be something I would have been interested in but actually doing it, I was like you know what this is actually something fun that I wouldn't have known that I would have liked if I didn't do it so it's a nice chance to sort of get away from that like medicine point of view and try something else if you don't like it at least you know you don't like it and then again for you to sort of hone in the specific sort of subject you're interested about. Like if you want to do surgery, some people do anatomy. You know, if you're interested in like the sort of social aspect of medicine, people do like medical anthropology, global health. So there's loads of different things you can integrate in that's sort of not even to do with medicine, but just something else, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo everything you said. Like I absolutely loved my integrated degree. So I did it in cardiology. Um, it's a really good chance, like both of you said, to like research and also like you said, Bridget, it's a good chance to like experience proper university life. Like it was so good to have lectures like three days a week and it's a half day. You're not there for like nine to five, like you would be in medicine lectures. Um, so yeah, no, it was quite good. Um, and I personally went to London because um, I wanted to experience, I wanted to live at home for a year. Um, I know a lot of people interclate because of the points, but I think it's not the most important thing. Like it's the experiences that you take away, it's the connections that you build. It's like the research experience you have, like obviously it's a great chance to get published as well. Um, also medical school doesn't really focus on research. It's something that you have to do like extracurricularly. Uh, but yeah, if you're into play, like it's an excellent opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna hop on for a second. I mean, there's two minutes left. So the next one about one, how would you prepare for question? So. I was thinking if everyone just gives like one tip on um like how they prepared and what they think's best and then we yeah, wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Um so yeah, I, I would say um my, my one tip would be to have a look at some of those common questions. So the common questions of why medicine and not nursing, um, what made you want to study medicine and have kind of a prepared answer for those and really think about those common questions that might come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So have a have a script for like all of the common ones and speak to the students who actually medical students or doctors have actually gone to the university because they'll be able to give you like good tips about what they actually look for in applicants as well. Um, I'd say as well as having a script, like it's good to have a script, but also try not to obviously sound too robotic like you've just memorized that script because they can tell that you just practice an answer. But yeah, it's very good because those common questions are common. There's a reason they're common. Loads of people do it. Mm -hmm. I think my one would be just practice, 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 like practice with your friends, practice with your family, get them to ask you those questions. You like sort of say goodbye to them. They can give sort of give you feedback, practice with any friends that you think are also applying to medicine as well. And just because especially with most people doing MMIs as well, like panel sort of stuff, learn on like your ethics. So just, yeah, I think it's just looking up all those common questions, just practicing. Um, I'd say if you mention an experience when you're answering a question, make sure that you actually say, why it was relevant or how it gave you that skill because don't just leave it after you've said what you did because that's not really enough 